Well, good morning and welcome. How's everyone doing? Good? Great. All right, that's about a four. So it was, we're, we're off to a start. I will, we'll call it that. Uh, we're actually in week four of a series uh, that we have entitled Core. And uh, we actually do this series every year, uh, and it's on our core values. So we have five core values here at the well, and uh, we kind of put them everywhere. So if you, haven't, if you haven't noticed them yet, I'm sure you will. And, and our fifth core value is what? Let's say it all together. Okay, say it like you actually want to. What's our fifth core value? Have fun. Oh, that's terrible. All right, so our fifth core value is actually have fun. <laughs> it's like, have fun. Do that now. Go quickly. All right, so our fifth core value is have fun. So every year, the last week in our series, we do a big fun service. And we do all kinds of crazy things. We've done confetti cannons and balloon drops and giant beach balls. This year, I think we're going to do everything. And, uh, and it's always a blast. And it's one of the easiest opportunities we have every year to be able to invite our friends. A lot of your friends, neighbors, family are like me. They didn't grow up in church. And so their experience with church was that it was boring or stale or confusing. And so a lot of times it just puts up barriers to people being able to come. And so to be able to have a service where you can say, hey, listen, it's going to be a blast. And know that we're going to say something important and inspiring for them to really challenge their hearts. So hopefully not only they'll have a good time, but we fully believe that they're going to experience the life and the love of Jesus. Um, so you don't want to miss that and you don't want your friends to miss it. Now, we recognize that Christ has to be the first, middle, and end of everything that we do. So we felt like it was essential before we put on all of the other things that we made sure and just paused and prayed and trusted God to do a work in their heart and to kind of cultivate that soil of their soul. And so we've been in 21 days of prayer and fasting. So the last two weeks, uh, we've had wellers literally praying around the clock and, and giving up meals and taking that time and setting it aside to pray for, for our friends, for our coworkers, our neighbors, just call calling out their names before the Lord. And this week, we're going to continue in that through Saturday. So if you want to join our prayer initiative, you can join. Uh, you can go to cometothewell.org forward slash 21 days. There's still places where you can sign up. Uh, there's still a couple days uh, left where you can fast if you'd like. And, uh, and so we invite you just to be a part of that. But even if you don't sign up, let's spend this week really praying for our friends, for our neighbors, for our coworkers, all those people that we've invited to come, that they'll come and really experience Jesus. Is that good? Are we good? All right. All right. So um, I've also been sharing with you in this series a little bit about what sort of makes my family tick, if you will. So some of the things that are, are central to us. So I shared with you that we, uh, we love the outdoors. I shared with you that, that I love being right here with you, that this is one of the most special and important things in my life. And, and we've just been sharing some of those things. Well, one of the other things that is, is super important to my family is the city of Chicago. Um, when we decided to, to move to, to, to kind of go and, and pursue our, our dream of what we felt like God was doing in our life, we really had the world in front of us. I had traveled my whole life. I had been all over the world. And so we just kind of got out a world map, and, and we were looking around and kind of praying. And, and for a time, we thought maybe we would go overseas, and we looked, at, uh, we looked at staying in Arkansas. We looked at a bunch of different things. And I'll never forget, one day I was uh, downtown Chicago up in the borders that was on the second floor right across the street at the time from um, the Water Tower Mall. And as I was looking down the Magnificent Mile, it was like God just dropped the city in my heart. And if you've ever had something like that, you know that it marks you, it changes you. And so from that point on, my, my face was kind of set uh, to come to Chicago. But when we came, we, we sort of uprooted our kids and displaced them, and they were young and not particularly happy with us. And, and, uh, and so for a long time, they always talked about wanting to go somewhere else. They wanted to go back to Arkansas, or we did a vacation one year in the Poconos. So they thought Pennsylvania was the promised land. And, and over the years, they just had looked at some different places that they felt like they really wanted to go. But over time, gradually, the rhythm of our life sort of caught up to my children's expectations and, and preferences. 
And so then when it was finally time for my oldest son to go to school, he decided he wanted to go into Chicago. That's where he wanted to go. And now my, my younger son has followed him into Chicago. And, and this past year, my daughter, my oldest daughter, Taylor, graduated high school. And uh, she decided what she really needed was, was like an independent thing. And so she was going to fly to California and meet up with a girlfriend, and then they were going to road trip it back here. So like 11 o'clock the night before she leaves, literally, she decides that the one thing that she needs before she leaves is this. Let's throw the picture up. She runs into the city and gets a tattoo of the city skyline with the flag. And, and here's what I want, want to show. My, my kids sort of were displaced in and, and coming up here. My, my, we're not indigenous to this, this area. My wife is a full-fledged hillbilly. She never owned shoes till I married her. And um, so, so, so we're not, we're, we're transplants, you know what I'm saying? This wasn't our home before, but it's become our home. And here's why. Because we recognize that coming here wasn't just about coming here or loving Chicago, and we do. But it was about coming here and giving up our life, literally wearing this city in our heart, in our spirit, in our prayers. Because here's the thing, because the thing that makes you fundamentally who you are, the thing that lives and breathes at the core of you, is not just about what you prefer over something else, nor is it strictly the pursuit of self. It's that thing that you would give your life up for. It's that thing that you would accept pain for. It's that thing that you would pay a price in order to experience. Sociologists say that the greatest human need is the need for transcendence, the need to make a difference, to feel like your life has meaning, has worth, that is somehow going to outlive you or reach beyond just the scope of your day and your times and the things that you can physically touch. That means every one of us want to need to live for something that is bigger than we are, something that transcends. We all are on this journey moving towards meaning, towards significance. Jesus gave us sort of a quest, a clarion call, a, an overarching meta-narrative, if you will, and he invited us into his story, into his quest, into his purpose. Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 18, Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth, therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach these new disciples to obey all the commandments that I've given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Now if we were to look at this, this call, this mission, this commission, that Jesus is giving to the disciples that's being handed down to us, it sort of breaks up into four specific steps, four specific things that he's asking them to do. The first thing he says is, listen, I want you to go and make disciples. I want you to find those people who are living in darkness, who are living in brokenness, who are living in fear, and I want you to invite them into light, into life, into joy, into peace. I want you to win them. Then next he says, the people that you have won, I want them to be baptized. In other words, I want them to be washed. I want them to experience a cleansing, a freeing of those hurts, of those twists, of, those, of all of the things that have plagued their mind and their heart and their relationships and their fears. I want them to be free of all of those things. And then I want them to be trained. I want them to be discipled. I want them to be matured. I want them to know all the things that you know about me and about one another, about how we're to live and what life is supposed to feel like and look like and, and what our experiences should be as we sort of meet together and connect with God in this world. Because ultimately, I want to send them into the world, just like the Father sent me, and I'm sending you, the apostles. You're going to be adding and sending and commissioning generations as long as there are generations. So God's original purpose, his destiny, his transcendence for our life was that we would win, that we would wash, that we would disciple, that we would, that we would be sent. Here at the well, we've restated that with our mission statement. It says that we love people into deeper levels of relationship with Jesus Christ. 
Let's just say this together this morning. We love people into deeper levels of relationship with Jesus Christ. We take those same four ideas and we've just sort of made them super clear for us to understand that we want people first and foremost to know God. We want them to enter into the kind of knowing, the kind of relationship that, that causes new life to spring up in their heart, in their mind, in their families, that they would really experience that. We want them to find freedom. We don't want them to be plagued by the things that have held them back, that have wounded relationships or, or continued to wound their heart. We want them to be free of anything and everything that would hinder them from making a difference in life. And then we want them to discover their purpose. We want them to, to know that God has made them to be a unique gift, that he has uniquely qualified and gifted them for a specific task within his, his greater meta-narrative. And we want them to discover that and be able to explore it so that ultimately all of us can make a difference. Make a difference in our lives. Make a difference in, in, in the life of the church. Make a difference in the lives of our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends, our family. Make a difference in our culture. So for us, success happens when people are all moving on the spiritual journey that God has for them. When, when people are, are, are growing in their knowledge of God, when the, those who know God are finding greater levels of freedom, when those people who are finding greater levels of freedom are learning to experience and express their divine purpose with greater clarity and fluidity so that their life has this overarching sense of worth, of meaning, so that you would know with absolute certainty that you matter, that your life matters, that you have meaning, that you have worth. So we've just been looking at those four things over the course of this series and sort of tracking them back to our mission and our core values, that, that knowing God and finding freedom and discovering purpose. And today, we're going to talk about this idea of making a difference and what does it really mean and what are, what's that last step that we need to take to really experience transcendence in our life. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, it says, God has given gifts to each of you from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Everyone look at your neighbor and say, you have a gift. Everyone look at your neighbor and say, you are a gift. So God has given each one of us a gift, and he's actually caused us to be a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. That's why when you look at your neighbor, they look so unique. We'll use that word. And, and, and then he says to us, manage them well so that God's generosity can flow through you. And here's the important thing that we understand is that God hasn't given you this gift. He hasn't made you a gift just for your own enjoyment, just for your own self-gratification. He actually says that he has given you this gift, he has made you this gift so that his generosity could be experienced through your life. That as you learn to be a person of thanks, a person of praise, a person of gratitude, as that kind of life flows through you, that all the people around you would sort of experience the nature, the character, the quality, the light and life of God through your life. Because finding transcendence, experiencing worth, requires us to live for someone other than ourselves. Finding transcendence, making a difference, that movement towards meaning requires us to live for someone other than ourselves. So let's look at our, our fourth core value today and see how we can sort of connect these things. So our fourth core value is in everything give thanks. So we're just going to take this statement, kind of break it into its two parts. We're going to start today by giving thanks. So if you're following along in the notes today, that's your first blank, give thanks. And we're going to look at Ephesians 5, verse 20. Ephesians 5 says, And give thanks for everything to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So give thanks for everything to God. In other words, acknowledge that everything you have that's good comes from God. So he gets thanks for everything in the name of Jesus. Now, so what we're talking about giving thanks is gratitude. Gratitude. 
We're talking about having a heart of gratitude. Now, gratitude, by definition, should be a natural outpouring. It should be a, a response. Anytime you experience love, anytime you experience blessing, anytime you experience protection, anytime you experience something like that, the natural feeling that wells up in your heart should be gratitude. Now, now that was never designed um, to be there to manipulate. So we don't use gratitude or thanks or praise to try to manipulate God. We don't use it to try to manipulate one another. And God did not create praise to try to manipulate us. Instead, it was a way for us to acknowledge and, and, and sort of set in our heart who God was and the impact that he was having in every area of our life. In the Old Testament, the ancients believed that, that everything in the universe was an opportunity to give thanks and praise to God. So they were on this lifelong Easter egg hunt looking for the fingerprint of God in everything that they did and everywhere that they went so that they could sort of pause and give praise and thanks to God who was the creator and the author of everything. In the New Testament, the idea of gratitude shifts just a little bit um, away from just his creation and his power, specifically focusing on the love of God that was expressed to us in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so the New Testament is constantly giving thanks not only for Jesus, but the impact of Jesus on our lives and that now somehow as we are connected to Jesus and his, his call, his mission, his destiny for, for his life, it becomes our life that our lives are changed. And so the things in the Old Testament or the New Testament that they're giving thanks for, they were giving thanks for the grace of God. They were giving thanks for the ability to preach the word of God. They were giving thanks for the gifts that God had placed in their life so that they could show forth the generosity and the love of God to everyone around them. This idea of gratitude, of thanks, of praise, it marks the New Testament writers' letters to the church, their gospels, their histories, their prophecies, everything, over and over and over. Paul said things like, every time I think of you, I stop and give praise to God. I'm so thankful that God has done such an amazing job in my life that I have the capacity to express his love to you. Over and over, this was sort of how they talked. In fact, Paul, when he was talking about um, the Last Supper, he connects the fact that Jesus, who uh, John says everything was created through him and for him and by him, he said, listen, if Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, the author and the giver of life, the Lamb of God, if he found it important to pause at the Last Supper and give thanks, how much more important is it for us to stop on a regular basis and just acknowledge that God has given us everything that we need for life and godliness and that every good and perfect gift is from him. Now, everyone falls into one of two categories. Um, years, uh, 400 and like 50 years before the birth of Jesus, there was a Greek doctor who uh, discovered that almost everyone fit into one of four categories, these four temperaments or personalities. Now today there's all kinds of different assessments to help you understand what you're, you know, has anyone ever taken like the DISC test or, or you've done, I mean there's all kinds of different things to help you understand what kind of person you are. But basically it all fell down into those four categories. And within those four categories there were really only two outlooks. So two of the temperaments, when they see a glass, they see that it is half full. And the other other two people, when they look at a glass, they see that it's in fact half empty. So, so let me just, just ask, how many of you are like glass half full people? Uh, all right, yeah, you, you're my people. That's right. So we're, we're like together. We are, we are hopeless romantics. We, we have uh, extreme levels of optimism. Every situation is an opportunity for something amazing. All right, so how many of you, you see the glass half empty? Yeah. 
yeah, you're the grouchy people that we have to deal with. Okay, so, so no, here, here's the reality. It doesn't matter what kind of temperament, what kind of outlook you are, because here's what you need to understand. However it is you see things is exactly how God made you. And it's not right, and it's not wrong. Some way isn't good, and some way isn't bad. Because here's the truth. Those people who, who see the glass half full all the time are the people who miss all of the details. And they're the ones who never think through all of the obstacles. And they commit without really realizing what it's going to cost at the end. And those of you who see the glass half empty are the ones who are constantly cleaning up our mess, which is probably why you're grouchy. But for those of us who, who, who are glass half full people, it's easy for us just to think that life is always good and it's always wonderful and it's just supposed to be that way. And we race through it without ever stopping to acknowledge that it is that way because God is that way and give him thanks. For those people who see things glass half empty, you see all of the processes and all of the systems and all of the steps and all of the obstacles and all of the costs. And if you're not careful, it can grind you down to where you don't even want to move. And if you're not careful with how you talk, you'll actually grind the people around you without ever stopping to acknowledge that God is still good despite everything that we have to overcome and that he has promised us a good future and hope and we allow the situation to dictate our praise and so it really doesn't matter what your temperament is we're all in the same boat that we have to learn to slow down and get our eyes off of the circumstances or off of our perception and look to God and acknowledge that he is fundamentally good that he is really present that he's the one working something behind the scene because Paul warns in Philippians, he says, listen, we should do everything in our life without grumbling, without complaining, without frustration, without stress-filled talk. And here's why. Because in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30, it says that a peaceful heart, another translation says a merry heart, leads to a healthy body. When you have this optimistic, great, uh, grat great uh, gratified um, thankful heart, what it does is it literally produces health in you. But what happens is when your outlook is jealous or contentious or coveting, what happens is that it's like cancer in your bones. And so God says, listen, if you can't be grateful, if you can't be hope-filled, it literally will have a negative impact in your body. But if you'll have this conviction that God is good, that he's faithful, that he's present, and you would communicate that all the time, then you will actually feel strengthened, healed, whole. So our core value says we have to give thanks in everything. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18 says, Be thankful in all circumstances. Everyone say all circumstances. So does that mean that I have to be thankful when my kids got in a wreck or they've gotten a ticket or I'm having to drive them to their 15th soccer game this week or my husband keeps spending money on fishing equipment, that's for you, Jim, or, you know, just whatever it is, I've got to be, yes, be thankful in, let's say it again, all circumstances. For this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. In other words, God's plan, God's purpose, God's destiny, his will for your life is that you would be thankful, hope-filled people. Because that's the only way that you're able to show, to demonstrate the love, the light, the generosity of God. In the Old Testament, the Jews didn't believe that, that gratitude was something that was strictly a byproduct of when everything in their life was going good. They actually believed that even when everything was going bad, there was still an opportunity to give thanks and praise to God because God himself was good. Because God himself was just. And because he was good and because he was just, they gave him thanks and praise knowing that he was more than able to do whatever it was that they needed, to be whatever it was 
that they needed. So Paul said in Philippians, he said, don't worry about anything. Don't, don't stress or struggle or strive. Don't do that. But instead, just pray. Just, just bring your needs, your concerns, whatever it is that, that, that's sort of plaguing your heart. Bring those things to God. Tell him what you need and then thank him for what he's already done. There's another passage where Jesus was talking to a massive group of people and he said, listen, you waste so much of your time worrying about food and clothes and shelter, all these things that you need. But what you don't understand is that I've got everything and more and when you will focus your attention on those things, they just get bigger and bigger and bigger in your life. But when you sort of take your attention off of those things and put it on me first, You contemplate my goodness. You speak about my promises. Then all of a sudden, all the other things in your life, they become more manageable. Jesus said, seek me and my kingdom first. And then all of those things, they'll be added to you. And so here's what I want to challenge us with. The only way we're really going to make a difference is if we could sort of pry our attention and our concerns and our fears off of our own needs. Because the highest need of humanity is making a difference. So the beautiful thing is, is God has sort of given us this process of which we draw our eyes away from ourselves and up towards Him. The more we focus on God, the more we see who He is the more he draws our attention back to one another. And he says, listen, I want you to go. I want you to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teach them everything that I have communicated to you. And be certain of this, that I'm with you always. Because here's the beautiful thing. It's very hard to be focused on yourself when you're actually working for the good of someone else. And here's the amazing thing, or maybe the horrifying thing. No matter what you're going through, no matter what your struggle is, no matter what your need is, right now there is someone probably in this room with a greater need. So what happens is when we start really shifting our attention away from our problem and giving thanks and praise to God and then begin to take that heart of joy and reflect the generosity of God to the people around us, not only do they begin to feel an impact, we start making a difference in the life of those people. They begin to experience the generosity, the nature, the character of God firsthand through you. And those problems, those situations, those circumstances in your life, they just keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. As those things get smaller and as you sense the work that God is doing in your life and the work that God is doing through your life, it just increases your praise. It becomes this beautiful cycle, this beautiful self-fulfilling prophecy of generosity and praise and love, grace and worth. Because your life has worth, it has meaning. But it's wrapped up in making a difference, not for yourself, but for someone else trusting God enough to know that he's got everything that you need so you don't have to hold back. That's what we do sometimes, isn't it? We don't give of our time because we're worried we won't have enough for ourselves. We don't give of our finances because we're worried we won't have enough for ourselves. We don't give of our expertise because we're worried we don't have enough for ourselves. We won't sacrifice time with family because we're afraid we won't have enough time for ourselves. And God says, you know what? When you stop worrying about that and you stop praise, start praising God for all the stuff you have, thank you, God, you've given me more than enough finances and I know that you're so faithful. It just helps me give more, more of my time, more of myself, more of my hope, more of my heart. The more I give, the more I mean. The more my life means. The more my life matters. The more my life makes a difference. So here's what I want you to do. If you have never found a meaningful place, a significant place to serve, I wanna invite you, I wanna challenge you to join one of our dream teams. Here at The Well, we've got about 130, 150 people 
that on a regular monthly basis are serving in hundreds of different areas. Right now as we're talking, there's a little boy and a little girl just on the other side of that wall whose lives are being changed for eternity because someone took the time to bend down and talk to them about Jesus, to express love to them in ways that are healthy and whole and give them the kind of touches that every one of us should have had when we were growing up so that they'll grow up with a completely different perception of church and faith than I did. Today, all of us got to come into this auditorium and sit in a beautiful, nice, clean space because during the week when no one else was here and no one was watching, a small army of people came in and ran vacuums and wiped things down and emptied the trash and cleaned the bathrooms so that when we came in anxious about our day and our families and our finances and our careers, that we didn't get tripped up on anything else and we were able to push past all of those things and find our way into the presence of God. This morning as you came in, there were some guys hanging out in the parking lot, just waving like, like knuckleheads, just, just to put you at ease from the minute you drove onto the property, just to let you know that we had already been thinking about you, that we had already been praying for you. And every one of those people this morning loved us into a deeper level of relationship with Jesus. We're experiencing more of God because because they served us when we weren't even watching. And I want you to know that there's a place for you to be able to serve God. And here's the beautiful thing. This isn't the end. This is just the training facility. We come here and we learn to serve because we're trying to have the nature and the character of God formed into our life so that when we leave this place, when we walk away from one another, that the light, the life of Jesus would be experienced through us in our neighborhoods in our homes, in our workplaces, at the supermarket, on the metro, on the L, on the CTA. That everyone that came in contact with us would somehow experience a spark of heaven because of the gratitude that we experience and express and the generosity of God that is allowed to flow through our lives. Your life matters. Let's make a difference. Would you stand with me? The worship team is coming. This last element in our service is called our encounter worship because we want you to encounter Christ and his Holy Spirit for yourself. We've created a couple of different touch points. If you'd like communion, the body and the blood of Christ, it'll be up here at the front in the doorway and in the back of the auditorium. If you'd like prayer, we have a couple families who are gonna come forward. They would love to have permission to pray with you. If you connect best through worship, the team is gonna lead us in a couple songs, but whatever you decide to do in this time, would you slow down just long enough to ask yourself the question, do I have a sense that my life is making a difference? Is my gaze, is my affection constantly being turned towards God and others? Or is it constantly focusing in on myself? Do I know the value? Do I know the transcendence of living my life for someone else? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this amazing day. We know it's a gift. God, help us make the best of it to redeem the time that we are given for you, for your kingdom so that others would experience life and love, joy, peace, kindness, generosity, faithfulness through us. That as they experience you in our lives, it would draw them into a, a deeper love relationship with you. That their life would be transformed, transfixed, set in eternity. That our life would gain value through their lives every life that they'll ever touch. We bless you, Lord. We worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said amen.
Just as I am, you've called. Just as I am, you've called. Cause you're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. I am loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am.
Paul wrote the church, he said that it was our destiny, it was God's will for us, it was our purpose, that we would be a people of praise, a people of thanks. For those of us who are in Christ, those of us who are in a life-giving, life-changing relationship with Jesus, because we could know with absolute certainty that Jesus had our life in his hand first step, the prerequisite to that is that we have to enter in to that relationship with Jesus if we want to experience that peace and that thanks. So I'm going to ask everyone just to close their eyes and bow their heads. If you're here this morning and you've not entered into a relationship with Jesus that has fundamentally changed you, but you want to, you want to be a people of praise, a people marked by this overarching sense that God has a plan and a purpose for your life. If that's you today, would you let me know? Would you just raise your hand? You can put it up and write back down. Thank you. Thank you. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I'm so sorry that I spend so much of my time and my attention focused on myself, on my fears, on my struggles, on, on the things that sort of snatch my attention and my affection away from you. God, I'm sorry that I pursue my own ambition, my own end more than I seek you. So Lord Jesus, I want all of that to change. I ask you to come into my heart, to come into my mind, to come into my life and begin to rewrite me, to make me what you originally intended, to allow the image, the nature of God to take shape in me again, to give my life a sense of transcendence. So Lord Jesus, I invite you to have your way. I take a step off the throne of my life and I invite you to be enthroned, to be my God and my King, to be my Lord and Savior. I love you, Jesus. I thank you in your precious name. And everyone said amen. If you prayed that prayer with me for the first time or maybe just the first time in a while, we would love to have permission to connect with you in your journey of faith. So if you'll grab one of our connect cards and give us just your name and email address, that's all we need. About halfway down the card, it says, I'm making a commitment today. And it doesn't matter if you check for the first time or a renewed commitment. Here's what I hope. I hope that you'll bring that up here to Vicki and let her just pray with you. Let her just seal that decision in your heart. But I would also love for you to go back to Well Informed. And we have a Bible for you. These are our new believer Bibles. It's the entire Bible written in everyday language. So it's really easy to understand and begin to apply to your life. But in addition, it has all kinds of additional information that help us understand why, why they did things the way they did, how we're supposed to approach prayer and God and one another, and, and how we're supposed to make sense of all of the ways that we all struggle. These are completely free. These are yours. They're in the back of the auditorium. We hope that you'll take advantage of those. If you're a Weller, you know that these communication cards are the best way to stay in touch with us. So if you've got something that we can celebrate with you or something we need to be in prayer with, 
please fill one of these out. You can drop them in the boxes on your way in and out. And uh, we will be praying for you this week, and especially now that we're in our, our season of prayer and fasting. Um, so we'll do that. If you're new here, you can flip it over to the other side and fill this out. And then if you'll take it back to well-informed where it says guest services, we actually have a gift for you today just to say thanks for coming and uh, gives us permission just to put a face to the name. We're going to shoot you an email this week, nothing else, we promise, and just let you know some of the ways uh, that we could serve and minister to you and let you let us know what might fit best. And uh, so we hope you'll take advantage of that. If you want to stay in this atmosphere right now, right through the door to my left, your right is our prayer room. There will be a family in there that will be happy to pray with you if you'd like or just give you some space and you can pray on your own. Um, but before we head in all those different directions, can we just raise our hands and receive a blessing this morning? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Peace to know that your life does have worth. It does have meaning. Peace and the confidence to make a difference in the lives of those around you so that they can experience the love, the character, the nature, the generosity of our God. And everyone said amen. Thanks so much for coming. We'll see you next week. Don't forget to invite a friend.